Over the last few months, we've been watching the network hash rate skyrocket as ASIC manufacturers ship overdue product to anxious customers. As the network passes the one petahash mark, we're joined by Benny and Emmanuel, two of the minds behind the cloud hashing project. Gentlemen, let's talk Bitcoin. <laughs> so uh, the, the first question that, that I have is, is there still an opportunity in mining? Because it seems like it's just it seems like the cost of of participating in that network is getting increasingly high and the time frame to actually recoup your investment is getting even smaller if you allow me to take that question to manual speaking here um absolutely uh, what we've seen is a bit of a shift in the usual mindset of um, of miners where they're used to ROIs in the space of two, you know two to four months depending on delivery we're seeing that shift towards you know you know, latter end of a calendar. So depending on when you receive your hardware and depending on when you made the purchase, you know, the, the, the network difficulty could have literally overtaken you. And in terms of is it is it profitable to mine? We'd say absolutely it is profitable. To, it's still profitable to mine. It depends on your strategy. It depends on your capital. And it depends on, you know, who you decide to partner with to, to be successful. If we look at what people have been doing in industry, as things stand now, people will be making orders from the, you know, the four, or I'd say major manufacturers, there are a few more coming online soon. And they would wait a period of three to four months. What our model is and the way in which we've approached that is to essentially use economies of scale to our advantage so to purchase large amounts of hashing power and then to redistribute that to customers. So we will be probably one of the first companies to literally enable you to log on and make a purchase of hashing power and to be mining within 10 minutes. That's a complete shift for what, from what the market is used to. And I think that's a model for years to come. Um, another, another thing as well is, you know, people say, you know, the, the money to be made in mining is within the two, first two to three months. Well, that is true, depending on what your model is. But it also, if you, if you have the ability to consistently or constantly add to the armory of your hashing power that you, that you have, it gives you a much better stance to, to pretty much fight the network difficulty. And you can't do that as a solo, mining, as a solo miner. And that, the, the whole market is going to shift. We believe mining belongs in the cloud, just as supercomputing does. And it kind of, uh, we've been pioneers in that field, and we believe it's uh, pretty much the way to go. So let's back up for a second here. Uh, can you tell me how you got into the space and if you've had any ventures in Bitcoin sort of things before? Have you been mining before you got into this cloud hashing business? Oh, yeah. I, I started off mining with, uh, with you know, my CPU when it, it was interesting. Then I got bored of it, then <laughs> kind of left it alone. Then the GPUs came into business and I gave that a bit of a go. And then my wife started getting a bit <laughs> annoyed from the heat and the noise and the lack of spare room when people came to visit. So I, I kind of popped the mining project to the side a bit. Then when ASICs came online, I thought maybe I could venture there because the hardware was smaller. It was supposedly less noisy and it was you could get more density out of it. But, you know, um, as time elapsed, um, more people became interested. So I began actually selling ownership of the machines to friends and family who were interested in Bitcoin just to give them the, the ability to do so. So I'd, I'd manage the, they just had to pay the bills. So, you know, that was the initial cloud hashing model. And it, it, it burst itself onto the internet in April this year. And, you know, we, we started selling contracts online and, you know, the rest is history. We pretty much grew organically from running mining equipment in the bedroom to running a, an organization now who have 1,300 individual customers. All right. Well, sounds like you've made some pretty fast inroads into the space. So let's talk about mining for a second. So the point of mining, I would argue, is to incentivize the distribution of the Bitcoin network to the greatest extent possible. But in a few years, you know, in the few years that we've gone from 2009 to, to the point we're at now, that really hasn't been the experience. It seems like because we've gone so fast through the generations of hardware, it's been very difficult for people to keep up. And essentially where, you know, a couple of years ago you could mine with your CPU as you started out, now someone who wants to experience it for the first time just at that sort of curiosity level doesn't have anything like that, doesn't have anything near like that. I mean, so what do you think of, you know, your, your service aside, what do you think of this trend, generally speaking? And, I mean, you know, if, if you hadn't been able to access it in the way that you did, do you think that you would have started mining? Yeah, I'll go into this a bit. The advent of CPU mining was essentially, as most people involved in 
Bitcoin mining are aware to verify the transactions on the Bitcoin network and incentivize people to be connected to the Bitcoin network. The entry into that market was largely in the tech field in the beginning because the configuration of mining software was not exactly user-friendly or ease of entry was quite high for the average individual that doesn't have background experience working from a console or something of that sort. And so in the beginning, people started developing GUIs to make it easier to begin to configure a mining platform software program. And then from there, it began to scale to more sophisticated tools and now monitoring tools and things of that sort. But it still has a large learning curve for people. And so one of the ideas that we had in the cloud hashing model was how do we ease the entry point into mining and at the same time, help people understand what Bitcoin mining is and why it's still advantageous to the Bitcoin network that people are mining Bitcoins. I mean, the incentive is there. People don't necessarily mine just because they're spirited to be miners. They do want to be rewarded. But the long-term plan for Bitcoin was that people were going to be mining because they're rewarded on the transactions that are taking place in the blockchain. So in essence, you are still incentivized in five years, 10 years time. And to get into that market as a individual that is looking to get familiar with mining and jump into it, it's not as simple as just go download a program and start running it on your CPU if it becomes quickly evident that there's no reward there for you. So we wanted to make it possible for people to understand that the reward is still there. You just have to be able to see how to get to it. And so the cloud hashing design is to be able to bring a person into mining, show them that there is an estimated ROI that is potential, and then that there's a difficulty that you're running up against. And so we're trying to make some of this more transparent to people that are walking into this and going, oh, mining, this makes sense. It just you know, throw some machine on and I should be making money. Well, with the cost of power versus the difficulty rising and the amount of equipment you need to overcome those costs, we believe that there's a scalable model that can work. And we've implemented that into the business model of cloud hashing to benefit the customers. And ultimately, we have a goal of benefiting the Bitcoin network alongside that. It seems like uh, one of the biggest challenges that you run up against in mining, however you're going to do it, is not necessarily the fact that the difficulty is going up so much as it is how you're timing your purchases relative to the rest of the world's release schedules. Because now there are several manufacturers in the space. Yeah. So, so I mean, yeah. so, you know, if you get a whole bunch of hashing power at the beginning and then two days later, there's a giant release and you're suddenly swept away. So how have you, have you been able to try and have you been able to, to, uh, to counter that risk? Yeah, to, to, to some extent, we were absolutely affected by those risks at the advent of the company. Um, you know, we made substantial orders of equipment that, you know, we were waiting to be delivered and, you know, customers were obviously being, um, were frustrated by the, by the delay. So being a cloud, a cloud company and being able to have the capital and the liquidity to, to go onto the open market, we're able to still service our customers because of the skill that we have. Now, in, re in respect to, you know, individuals having to make those kind of purchases and waiting three to four months where the ROI literally dwindles away. Now, we believe that model will die out because people might not be able to stomach the risk. The, there's, the, a lot of money has gone into pre-orders and a lot of people are still waiting for delivery and a lot of people have lost money and a lot of people have been dissatisfied with how it's been handled and might not even play again. The model we're offering is, 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 is very different. So we essentially are the kind of orders we make kind of you know it, it gets people's attention it gets the attentions of the manufacturers so you can work closely with them to ensure that customers are not burned by those kind of delays i mean if, if you're an individual making an order you know through the website you'd be treated differently from if you're if you're if you're a large organization looking to have a long-term business relationship to pr pretty much service your customers and at the same time benefit the manufacturer and i think th the manufacturers themselves they would prefer to deal with larger organizations rather than loads of customers constantly getting back to them 
oh my ASIC doesn't work. Oh the you know the the, the power unit has has blown up. How do I sort this out? And th those kind of issues will pretty much be dwindled away if you just took it to the cloud. They'll be dealing with one entity or sorry, actually four or five entities instead of the instead of the the many. And um, you know that's how we've mitigated our risks. Pretty much working with the manufacturers ourselves directly. And pretty much being in being in the know of the project scope and you know any potential delays, so that we can adequately um, make alternate arrangements for any delays. So that's that's kind of where we are now, and that's you know we're, we're seeing that mature as a model. So do you basically have uh, units standing by, and so when people buy them, then they just switch over to their account instead of crediting you? Who I assume you're running them yourself while, when you don't have customers to run them for, right? Yeah, the way in which we work. I mean, I'll give you a, ba a small background of our model without selling. Um, we we will purchase large quantities of of ASIC hardware. We will put them in data centers, and a data center would have an agreement with us to manage them, or we have our own person to manage it, depending on which city it, it's in. Now, those equip the, the equipment will be mining constantly. Now, a customer would go through our website would make a purchase for hash and power. Now, from the 30th of September this year, as soon as they make that purchase, within 10 minutes, they would be manning automatically because that hardware is already available. It's already there. So there is no delay. There is no pre-order. There is no wait. It's instantaneous. And that's what people are used to in the, in, in the, in, in the, cloud, in the cloud space. They're not used to making a purchase and waiting three to four months or not given a definite time for delivery. They're used to making a payment and getting what they've paid for instantaneously. That's the model that we've switched to, and that's the model we believe is it, it's palatable for the mass, for the mass market. Now, and another, another thing is, regards to difficulty increases, how do you deal with customers worried about the day-to-day, -day, well, sorry, the, 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 the bi-weekly difficulty increases, and how do you pretty much keep them motivated to, to mine, and also keep them motivated to, um, that they know that they're actually going to get an ROI. What we do is we'll essentially only sell up to 60% of any capacity that we have. At the end of each month, what we do is we, we purchase on the behalf of the clients the hashing power that we have as a reserve so that they get an increase in hashing power so that it allows them to either stay in line or at least not feel the mass effect of the difficulty on their, on their returns. Now, that's a better model than sitting on a piece of hardware that every two weeks the, the returns are dropping by 20%, 30%. You know? So that, that's, that's the model we've adopted, and that's the model the market will be used to. So we've, that's what we've worked out with, with um, you know, talking to customers, pretty much getting, a, getting an idea of the kind of things that pretty much take them off and to trying to adapt to the needs of the customers on that front. So I'll also comment on the network hash rate unpredictability that a lot of miners are seeing. This is clearly a risk that miners are taking when they're buying hardware on the on the market that has the pre-order basis. Is you know we've often said to people that it's a lot easier to look at the network hash rate to determine what your potential return is because the network hash rate is in flux on a constant basis, whereas your difficulty changes are built into the algorithm of the Bitcoin design. And so if you're in the know in terms of researching and discussing and finding out what the supply chain challenges are of various manufacturers, it's a little easier to predict what the network hash rate might look like at a certain point in time in a given period. Now, we don't know in a year from now, but we might be able to say in three months based on these companies, we can somehow gauge that the network hash rate is going to be between X and Y. And then if we say that your hash rate with cloud hashing is this, and that based on our model, the hash rate of your account will increase based on the estimates of the network hash rate increasing in a proportionate way, you have a way of being able to calculate some, with some degree of accuracy what your ROI could be. Now, we don't know if a company is going to come out of the left field that no one's heard of and dump an enormous amount of hashing power onto the network, perhaps a ASIC manufacturer that nobody saw coming. That's always a possibility. There's nothing anyone can really do to prevent those kinds of things happening except for be prepared. And that kind of preparation that we take is in the accumulation of good business partnerships with ASIC manufacturers that want to support not just us, but the fact that we are redistributing this hashing power to the customers. This is a really key point. 
in one of the reasons why ASIC manufacturers have worked with us so closely because they believe in the business model that we have. Sure, there's a lot of companies that just want to make a profit. There's a lot of individuals that just want to dump a lot of money into mining hardware and immediately mine for themselves. We get that. We understand that there's always going to be that market out there where there's people that are very bull on the you know long term of Bitcoin. They'll put money into mining and take the risks. But the attitude that our customers have is that cloud hashing is going to support them and that the manufacturers are going to support cloud hashing and in turn, everyone should benefit. We found that the manufacturers that understand our business model want to keep our customers in line with the network hash rate increases as much as possible. Reason being is that like any manufacturer, your goal is not to sell a product to somebody once, it's to sell a second and a third and a fourth time. We believe in the same model. We want our customers to be return customers, repeat customers. We want them to tell their friends that this is working for them. So for us to just sell one contract to one person is not our ultimate goal. We want people to believe in the model and understand that there is a long-term benefit to cloud mining and that it actually has a benefit to the Bitcoin network because what we're doing is making it possible that one or two or a small group of individuals do not have all of this mining power for themselves. As a result of that, more people are involved in Bitcoin. It's distributed as a currency to more individuals out there, and hopefully that will help the Bitcoin network thrive. Okay, I have a couple of questions off of those two answers. (laughs) First off, is the increase of hashing power standard or is there a cost associated with it? The way the model works is we essentially, you know, the customer would make a p- payment for the co- the contract. In the contract, we specify the two different costs associated with the contract. So one is a management fee, then the other is a reinvestment. So we essentially enable the customer to make a payment of up to 30% of whatever the minor revenue is, we're soon going to allow that to be variable, make a payment of what they want to reinvest in hashing power, and that would automatically be deducted from the, uh, the payouts. So that would then go into hashing power at the end of each month. So if they made $100 and you know they've set it to 30%, they would take $30 and use that to buy more ASIC uh, hashing power for themselves. I'm just wondering if there's a, what the ratio is there, because it seems like as someone who might be interested in one of these, I'm trying to figure out if that actually is even something that it would be beneficial for me to, to pursue, because 30% oh, of what we're, so 30% would be buying you more than just taking the payment would be? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Okay. The, the, the price that you'd be paying with the reinvestment is a lot less than you would be paying with a contract. So there's a massive benefit there. So if you bought in at the con, I mean, one thing people need to be aware of as, of, as well is there's a massive increase in hashing power, but also the cost per giga hash is dropping. So if you look in January, we're looking at costs down by maybe 80% per giga hash. So we can either buy in if we could buy in the future on behalf of the customer. So maybe in three to four months' time, they would get multiples of what they started with as a, as a miner. Now, how would you do that as an individual mining? And how could you ensure that you have the hardware on the day you want the hardware to start mining without making a loss? You couldn't do that as an individual unless you had a lot of capital and a lot of patience. So doing it in the cloud gives you that benefit because it's managed on your behalf. One of the things that allows industry to scale is to have a lot of people backing that industry. And we looked at that as part of how the model has to integrate. When we designed cloud hashing, we realized something that was very critically important, and that is that it's not all about how much hashing power you have. The number specifically isn't that important. It's about how many people are part of something that are collectively working towards a goal. And because the cloud hashing customer base is well aware that when they sign up, this is something that they're signing into, that it is a collective initiative in a sense to be able to increase the cloud mining capacity for the benefit of all customers. So even though it's 30% as an individual, that 30% goes a lot further than that same 30% that you would be taking in as an individual miner and then hopefully taking that money and then putting it towards, say, your next purchase of an ASIC when you reach the ROI point that you can now afford your next one. So on your behalf, 
every month this increase is taking place. It's adjusted in your hash rate in our system. It's visible to you as a client, and you're immediately mining with that adjusted hash rate as soon as it takes effect. So whereas as an individual miner that's buying hardware, you're actually sitting and waiting for that hardware to reach a ROI point where you can now go and buy the next thing. With us, 30 days later, or however, maybe less, you have immediately taken some additional hash rate and put it into your account, and now you're mining with that. And this is the ability to scale with the network hash rate increase better than waiting on the next hardware to show up at your doorstep. So I hear the decentralized argument, and I think that I agree with you on the decentralized argument, but don't you as the service provider actually control all of these? It seems like people aren't actually mining, they're more the recipient output. You know, like instead of it going to right. your wallet, it goes to their wallet. So, so is, isn't sure. there a differentiation? Do they choose like what pool they participate in or is there any control? Well, I'm glad you asked uh, that question. Well, one of the things that will be rolled out here with the next September mine is the cloud hashing technology, which is going to offer a pool technology to miners in a very innovative way. It'll be the first mine that we're aware of that allows people to both mine in the cloud based on the cloud hashing model as well as allowing those customers as well as others that are not customers of cloud hashing to mine through the cloud hashing mining portal. And that will essentially make it possible for anybody that wants to mine within the cloud hashing cloud, you might call it. We're kind of dropping the cloud word a lot here, but allows people to access this cloud and be able to participate in it as well. And on the topic of decentralization, one of the uh, sticking points that has been uh, often debated is what makes it decentralized. If you were, for example, a large pool, and we've seen this out there with other mining pools, what happens if you reach 51% of the network? There's a very common concern amongst miners out there about the 51% attack potential that a mining operation could achieve if they had so much hashing power that they could overtake the network and do what they call a double spend. One of the technologies that we're implementing into the mining design that makes this very advantageous for the technical miner is the ability to select transactions that a person wants to mine within our system. This is something that we haven't seen out there done before by other mines, and this allows people to select the transactions and, in essence, makes it a truly decentralized model from the outsider connecting to our mine, which means that, in essence, a 51% attack would be highly unlikely, if not next to impossible. We're taking the power away from ourselves and putting it in the hands of people that are connecting through our portal. So... It's become very commonplace now that we're often asked by customers and engaged by people in general conversation in Bitcoin about these Bitcoin mining calculators. For example, one of the more popular ones that has become almost a staple in conversation as of late is the one on the Genesis block, which is the mining dot Genesis block or the Genesis block dot com. And they have a mining dashboard where they are allowing you to look at a matrix of all the different manufacturers and their hardware and their costs and so on. What these tools are essentially designed to do is give a person a perspective on what their potential ROI is. What these things fail to do is give a person a perspective on what changes based on new hardware being introduced on the supply chain basis that we talked about. The miners have just a few fields to fill in and suddenly they're able to predict based on these calculators what their ROI is. It's a little deceptive to people because what your ROI is is largely based on your scalability, not just based on the fact that you can plug in a number and that the network is going to scale based on X, Y, and Z. The Genesis block, for example, shows the average over some period of time of difficulty increases and then comes up with a prediction of the diff in the next month or the next couple of months over what they believe will be you know some period of time well there's also a supply chain aspect to making that even a probable uh, possibility you should say you can't continually increase the network over and over and over again without having some pretty massive supply chain 
issues that will be hard to overcome for all manufacturers once the network reaches a certain size and the difficulty reaches a certain size. Can I, can I also add to that? There's also the economic uh, economics aspect to that in terms of if, you, if we're talking about the network being a 15 petahash, for example, or 20 petahashes, how many millions of dollars will need to be spent to cover the difficulty rise of 80%? When, when we're talking about a 51% uh, um, style attack every 30 days or so. And, and on top of that, we're talking about you know, an infinite amount of money being able to be thrown into a market. Right now, there's worth $1.4 billion. I'm talking about the Bitcoin as a whole. I'm not even talking about the, the mining market. How? I mean, that's probably you know, $100 million. Who knows? Maybe less. You know? So it, it's, it's not... It, I don't think the tool is meant for exact calculations of what hashing power is. It gives people an indicative figure, but at the same time, it's deceptive because people don't know what other factors are are uh, necessarily going to affect the, the growth of the Bitcoin network. I mean, for example, if we're going to have growth, consistent growth in the 50s, in the 50, uh, above 50%, we're going to need new technology, maybe 14 nanometer technology that costs $16 million just to get the, just to, get to the foundry and to, to even make an ROI, how many millions of dollars more do you have to sell? So things like this haven't been thought of. And I, and I think it's, it's, people need to be aware that, you know, just plugging into a Genesis block is not a, is not a sure thing to say that you will not make a profit or you will make a profit. Do you think that this is a one-way trip for us and that the difficulty at this point, because there are so many players involved, can only go up? Or do you think that the price actually is going to play a role at some point and that the price actually needs to go up in order for mining to continue to be profitable? Well, price is always a thing. I mean, there are three things here. One, the cost of electricity. So if you can get electricity dirt cheap, then you could mine with, you know, if you mine with the best equipment and you get electricity really cheap, then you could run your hardware as long as humanly possible compared to having something, some another piece of hardware that's less efficient in a, in a state like California where you, you might not get the best energy rates. So, you know, that's one aspect. You could Your strategy could be based on, you know, a long-term strategy where you could see that you just essentially want to hit your ROI based on what the cost it's costing you to run, then there's another model of, you know, let me make as much money as I can in the next three to four months, um, buy as much hardware as I can, make my ROI and go home. The rest of the, the other model is kind of like our model is, you know, see it out for the next two to three years, make your, make your money back, try and spread it over a three-year period so that at least you can benefit from any rises in that window or space. I do believe everything is going to be controlled ultimately by price. If, if, if Bitcoin does not get adopted, then you're, we're mining for no reason. If the adoption continually grows, then we're going to see higher and higher um, prices of Bitcoin, and then we'll, that would even, you know, even price is an is an has an effect on on mining. So you find suddenly people that turned off maybe their ASIC that's discredited a year ago would now decide to turn it back on or the FPGAs or the GPUs just because it's costing more than electricity just to run. So we're going to see, you know, volatility on in, in the difficulty. We're going to see volatility in the, in the hashing power coming onto the network based on prices. And um, yeah, we hope prices will go higher. We believe it will because adoption ultimately is a goal. And we're seeing greater and greater adoption in other countries where aren't actually talked about in a lot of the news. Benny and Emmanuel, if someone wants to learn more about cloud hashing, how should they go about it? Just simply visit um, cloudhashing.com. We have an intuitive video that gives you an intro to the concept of cloud mining, and hopefully it makes sense. And if you have any questions, just drop an email to info at cloudhashing.com. We'll be happy to help. We'll check in with you in about six months and see where the hash rate is. Thanks for joining us on Let's Talk Bitcoin. Thanks, Adam. Hi, this is Jason King, founder at Sean's Outpost, and you are listening to Let's Talk Bitcoin. Sean's Outpost is a homeless outreach in Pensacola, Florida, and we are proudly powered by Bitcoin. To date, over 13,000 meals have been fed to the homeless in our area, all purchased with Bitcoin and through the generosity of the cryptocurrency community. Read more about us at seansoutpost.com. Food, shelter, Bitcoin, everybody. Sean's Outpost.com.